everybody. Um, my name is Becky Smith. I am the Assistant Director for International at Advance HE, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here today. Uh, I am honoured to be joined by Dr. Leticia Jimenez, uh, who is the Academic Director from the Inter-American Organisation for Higher Education. I'm also joined today by my colleague Doug Parkin, who is our Principal Advisor for Leadership and Management at Advance HE. So welcome to you all and uh, we hope that this session today is going to really help you focus on leadership in higher education and what works and what is effective. And we're going to guide you through some of the findings that we've discovered and some of the um, attributes and aspects of leadership and management that we're hoping to explore further with you. In terms of the agenda for today, Doug, if we could move on, please. Okay. Um, what we're looking to, to cover um, really is to begin with, I'm going to give you a short introduction to the work of Advance HE and how we support higher education globally, uh, particularly in the Americas. And I'm then going to hand over to Letitia, who is going to uh, outline some collaborative work that we have undertaken together to research the managerial competences of higher education leaders in Mexico. We're then going to broaden that out and have a look at how higher education leadership across the world um, really is shaped and how it looks uh, from different perspectives. And Doug is going to hopefully lead an interactive portion of the session today uh, to talk a little bit about a global leadership survey and framework that we are developing at Advance HE in collaboration with the entire global higher education sector. So if I can move on to the next slide, please, Doug, uh, just to give you a short introduction to Advance HE. We are a UK-based charity and non-profit organisation, but we work globally. And we work globally to support higher education to shape its future, both at strategic and organisational levels. We do this by supporting the development of staff and teams within the sector, focusing very much on the staff and not so much on the students, but our end goal is to support the students and society as a whole. We work with individuals, we work with institutions, we work with governments and we work with sector bodies. And our three main strategic goals are to enhance confidence and trust in higher education, to address systemic inequalities for staff and students and to advance education to meet the evolving needs of students and society. We are a member led organisation and we have over 390 institutional members around the world. I'm um, really proud to say that the growing number of those members are actually from outside the UK um, and we have a number now across the Americas as well. Membership of our organisation is optional and we work with anyone wherever they may be in higher education, whether they are a member or not. But membership does bring some benefits uh, to those institutions that decide to, to opt into that. If I can move to the next slide, please, Doug. Um, so we work with governments and institutions and individuals in a number of different ways. So we develop a number of programs uh, which support the strategic goals um, and support interventions required within institutions. We have a number of different um, publications throughout the years, surveys that we perform um, to provide and generate knowledge and insights for the sector as a whole. We also provide professional recognition and we accredit institutions and programmes within institutions in terms of supporting the goals that we strive for. And really what we're trying to do is offer a range of consultancy and development services, as well as training and uh, support to institutions so that they can actually become more competitive and better equipped to do what they do best. So um, I've mentioned already the membership but we also, I think, pride ourselves very much on connecting individuals within the global community of higher education to form extensive networks of communities of practice and expertise in their specialist areas. So across the Americas, um, we have actually undertaken a range of work across the three strands that we specialize in. 
And Doug, if you could just move to the next slide, please. Um, so to focus on uh, the work that we've done in the sphere of leadership, management and governance in higher education, um, we are actually going to focus very much in today's session about some of the work we've most recently done in Mexico to support research there, looking at the managerial leadership competencies. But in addition to that, um, I mentioned earlier, we also offer a number of training and development programmes, and many of those programmes now are offered online and are accessible wherever you may be in the world and include programmes such as those designed specifically for university presidents and vice chancellors. We have a vice chancellor's transitions programme, for example, and we have a top management programme, as well as strategic leadership and management programmes supporting all levels across an institution. In the area of teaching and learning, we have uh, developed in collaboration with the sector a number of different programmes that support and enhance teaching and learning excellence. So, for example, uh, we have a very popular certificate in teaching and learning in higher education, which has been modelled on best practice in a number of universities across, for example, the UK, Australia, the US and so forth. This programme can help institutions who do not currently have their own in-house um, teacher development programme. But in addition to that, we can also accredit existing programmes. And if programmes become accredited, they are able to award fellowship. And fellowship is offered by Advance HE to institutions that align their programmes with our professional standards framework in learning and teaching in higher education. Fellowship now is a community of over 150,000 fellows globally. Um, so it's an incredibly rich, extensive network of those practitioners involved in teaching in higher education. And really pleased to give you an example from the Americas, um, Utah Valley University in the US, for example, now has an accredited program and they have developed um, their staff through that program and have recognized over 80 of their staff members as fellows of Advance HE. In terms of our work relating to equality, diversity and inclusion, examples recently include running a STEM mentoring program uh, specifically aimed at women um, who are um, working in the science um, sector in universities in Peru. And this has been done in collaboration with the British Council in Peru, but also with the National Council of Science and Technology and Technological Innovation uh, of Peru, known as CONCITEC. Some of you may be familiar. And we've also worked with the Peruvian Committee Pro Women in STI in that country. So that programme has been an intensive programme to support them in enhancing their mentoring of women in science and technology in higher education. But we've also worked in this area of supporting uh, equality and diversity in the US where we've contributed to the development of a charter programme called Sea Change, which is really designed to support the recognition of um, institutions progression towards gender equity and racial equity. Similarly, in Canada, we've been working with NSERC, which is the National Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And we've also worked there with other bodies to implement something called the Dimensions Gender Charter. And this was launched two years ago now, and it's based on the Athena Swan Charter that we have in the UK to support gender equity in higher education. So both those countries now have been piloting these gender charters and have actually made awards to institutions based on their progress. So at that point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to Letitia and she is going to talk to you a little bit more about the research that we have been very proud and happy to contribute to with the Inter-American Organization for Higher Education. So over to you, Letitia. Gracias, Becky. Buenos días a todos. Yo voy a hablar en, en español. Eh, primero, bueno, este, agradecer la, 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 la conjunción de nosotros en este foro. Eh, de verdad, fue para nosotros un placer trabajar con Advance esta, esta investigación. Eh, les comento que yo les daré un breve resumen de lo, que, de lo que ha implicado o de lo que implicó durante un poco más de un año esta investigación. 
Eh, bueno, esta, esta investigación surge en el seno de la Organización Universitaria Interamericana, ¿sí? el lugar donde yo trabajo, donde como Becky mencionó, bueno, este, soy directora académica en este momento, pero en, en 2020, 2019, 2020, eh, yo todavía era eh, directora del Instituto de Gestión y Liderazgo Universitario. La siguiente, por favor. El Instituto de Gestión y Liderazgo está enfocado dentro de la OBI a la formación de directivos y fue ahí donde nos centramos. Este es un instituto que tiene casi 40 años funcionando, formando líderes, sobre todo altos mandos de las universidades, en las más de 350 universidades que conforman nuestra membresía a lo largo de todas las Américas. Y... Como, como un programa, como cualquier otro programa, bueno, eh, es, un, es un programa que tiene ciclos y precisamente en esta etapa llegaba su ciclo de, 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 de poder eh, revitalizarse, de poder investigar qué, qué más está, qué, qué estábamos haciendo bien, pero también qué estaba, qué estaba necesitando nuestro, nuestro grupo de directivos, miembros de la, de la OI. Y lo que decidimos fue, bueno, empezar a trabajar en la búsqueda de... Este, de, de esas necesidades. Siguiente, por favor. Eh, nosotros estamos conscientes eh, desde la OVI, desde, desde el IGLU específicamente, que eh, en la educación, en cualquier tipo de educación, pero específicamente en la educación superior, eh, los líderes tienen una influencia definitivamente. A lo mejor no podemos medirla exactamente, pero sabemos que está ahí. Reconocemos pues que hay otras áreas, que hay áreas muy importantes que, que van directamente al impacto del aprendizaje de los estudiantes, eh, como pueden ser eh, prácticas eh, pedagógicas, como pueden ser aspectos in, eh, organizacionales, como pueden ser modelos educativos, instalaciones. Sin embargo, creemos definitivamente que la gestión directiva sí puede, desde las decisiones que se toman en las rectorías, en las direcciones, impactar en el mejoramiento y en, y en la eficiencia del aprendizaje de nuestros alumnos. Por eso fue que eh, le dimos esta, la, la, la gran importancia a este tema de renovar la formación que estábamos teniendo para nuestros directivos y la mejor forma, bueno, era preguntarles ¿no? qué necesitan y ir directamente a las universidades y sentarnos con ellos y ver qué, qué es lo que está pasando con los directivos eh, de las instituciones de educación superior. Para ello, bueno, tuvimos el, el, el gran apoyo de, del Ministerio de Relaciones Internacionales de la Francofonía, del gobierno de Quebec en, en Canadá, donde están nuestras oficinas. Y, este, bueno, con, con, con los fondos, eh, con, con gran parte de fondos de ellos empezamos a hacer este trabajo y, por supuesto, bueno, eh, con la ayuda de otros socios. Siguiente, por favor. What steps data analysis analyst? Eh, Definitivamente el apoyo de Advance fue eh, primordial, ¿sí? su papel en esta investigación fue una gran experiencia, ya les explicaré un poquito más adelante eh, que, eh, que cuál fue el, el, el gran aporte, pero eh, sin lugar a duda nuestros socios hicieron posible esta, este, este, el desarrollo de esta investigación y la obtención de esta información que nos va a servir a final de cuentas a todos. Eh, por la parte académica tuvimos el apoyo de la Universidad de Montreal, y de la Universidad Veracruzana, que trabajaron con nosotros a nivel investigativo, a nivel de, de aportación de, de investigadores expertos en el área de competencias, ¿sí? y este, por parte de las organizaciones universitarias de México, tra trabajamos con ANUYES, que es la Asociación Nacional de Universidades e Instituciones de Educación Superior, y la ANUD, que es la Asociación Nacional de Universidades Tecnológicas. Ellas nos, ayudaron, eh, nos apoyaron muchísimo con la movilización de directivos, con el, la, la aplicación y la convocatoria para los, para los cuestionarios. Siguiente, por favor. Eh, en esta, en esta eh, lámina les, les quiero hacer rápidamente eh, cuál fue nuestro plan de investigación. Bueno, eh, consideramos al principio que era importante tener... Eh, Dos fases que nos permitieran, una primero, tener un, un acercamiento 
eh, muy rápido, muy, muy cercano con, con directivos y optamos por hacer un, un focus group. Queríamos rescatar algunas primeras impresiones por parte de ellos para poder pasar con mayor solidez a la segunda etapa que fue la aplicación del cuestionario. ¿Sí? Y en este cuestionario, bueno, eh, lo, que, lo que hicimos fue obtener ahora sí eh, un, un primer mapeo de, esos, de esas competencias que consideramos que se deben de, en este momento o en, en, en esta generación de líderes trabajar específicamente para ayudarlos en su, en su gestión. La siguiente, por favor. En este sentido, bueno, trabajamos primero con, eh, con el grupo focal y luego hicimos la encuesta y posteriormente el reporte final. No me voy a detener mucho para, para tratar de agilizar con el tiempo. La siguiente, por favor. El punto de partida para nosotros, para nosotros poder trabajar eh, esta, es, esta investigación, bueno, primero fue definir qué entendíamos por, por competencia, cómo eh, conceptualizábamos desde la OI, desde el IGLU, esas competencias para poder encaminar la, la, la propia investigación. ¿sí? Entonces entendimos bueno, que la competencia es, eh, es un saber, es un saber complejo y, y que es, es el resultado de una integración movilización y aplicación sinérgica, ya sea de conocimientos, habilidades y actitudes, que finalmente las podemos verificar en situaciones que se repiten o que tienen las mismas características. La siguiente, por favor. En este sentido, trabajamos eh, la primera etapa, como les comentaba, la primera etapa fue un, un grupo focal y tuvimos la gran suerte de contar con el apoyo de eh, la NUYES, Hicimos una reunión presencial exactamente antes de que cerrara, eh, se cerraran las fronteras con la, con la pandemia. Estuvimos en Ciudad de México, en el Centro de Calidad de, de la Núñez, donde pudimos eh, reunir a 30 altos directivos de 20 instituciones de México y que representaron 12 regiones del país en un intercambio muy productivo de, de 8 horas, fue un, un día completo en el, el que estuvimos trabajando y que, este, que nos dio algunos resultados. ¿sí? Eh, bueno, el propósito era tener un, un, acercarnos a un primer perfil de competencias, eh, un poco escuchar qué era lo que tenían que decirnos los directivos, entender cuál era la percepción de ellos respecto a lo que era una competencia, cómo la vivían, este, cómo, la, cómo la trabajaban ellos desde su realidad. ¿sí? La siguiente, por favor. La siguiente. ¿Qué encontramos? Eh, nosotros esperábamos obtener de, este primer, de esta primera etapa de la investigación eh, un mapeo, una, un, una visión general de lo que eran las, las, eh, las competencias. Y bueno, lo obtuvimos. Fue un trabajo muy fructífero, la verdad. Eh, tuvimos un, un gran aporte de estos 30 directivos con mucho entusiasmo. Eh, identificamos también que en este primer mapeo que ellos hicieron, eh, tuvieron, eh, tuvieron el, el, la, encaminaron las competencias generalmente o las, o las seleccionaban como prioritarias o las seleccionaban como básicas o funcionales. Eh, esta es una clasificación que nosotros tomamos en cuenta para establecer esa metodología. Si a alguien le interesa el, el, el documento, está en nuestra página de la OUI, en el repositorio de la página de la OUI, y se puede descargar libremente. Creo que también lo tienen en Advance, en inglés. Nosotros lo tenemos en español y en inglés, ellos lo tienen en inglés. Pueden este, acceder a él. Eh, un paréntesis. Otra, otra de, las, de los resultados que obtuvimos fue este, que identificamos dentro, de los, eh, dentro del discurso de los propios... Eh, directivos de los propios líderes que estuvieron con nosotros en la reunión, una dificultad para distinguir las competencias, ¿sí? Y eso nos ayudó, bueno, a, a, a fortalecer nuestro, nuestro entusiasmo por la, por la investigación. También obtuvimos algunos otros datos que considero importantes mencionarles. Bueno, eh, tuvimos una fuerte contribución descriptiva por parte de los líderes de habilidades y conocimientos requeridos para ejercer su puesto. ¿Sí? Ellos mismos nos, nos ayudaron a comprender esa, esta necesidad de analizar esta generación con sus nuevas competencias. También este, aportaron un buen número de indicadores. Quiero comentarles rápidamente que la, la forma en la que trabajamos en el Focus fue que ellos 
nos ayudarían a identificar las principales competencias que ellos consideraran para, para el desempeño de su trabajo, nos, la, nos darían una definición de esa, de, esa, de esa competencia, pero también nos darían indicadores de cómo, creen, cómo creían ellos que podrían eh, medirse. Y entonces obtuvimos un buen mapa con todos estos elementos y finalmente, bueno, la, la, la reiterada ex, eh, exposición de ellos nos dijo que fue una, una reflexión muy fuerte para ellos mismos buscar dentro de su, de su práctica eh, cómo, cómo era que estaban funcionando. ¿Sí? Eh, la siguiente, por favor. Estos son... Les presento, estos son los, los, eh, los resultados. Este es el inventario general que nosotros hicimos. Y finalmente, bueno, no, no los voy a leer, pero son, son eh, competencias que nosotros ya sabíamos que, que podían aparecer dentro del discurso. La siguiente, por favor. Ok, la segunda etapa que, es, que fue la más importante y aquí es donde eh, agradecemos muchísimo la participación de Advance. Ellos eh, nos acompañaron durante todo este proceso de, eh, de, de, de este cuestionario, de aplicar esta encuesta de competencias. Tuvimos prácticamente una mentoría de su parte para poder este, aplicar esta, esta, eh, esta encuesta. Lo primero, bueno, fue que nos, nos proporcionaron una una herramienta con la que pudimos hacer el, el, la encuesta. Tuvimos que hacer algunas adaptaciones, pero bueno, finalmente la encuesta quedó con 40 ítems. Eh, la participación de los, de los directivos, se convocaron a directivos de las universidades de México y este, la participación fue muy amplia, 105 universidades, 981 personas eh, eh, nos respondieron, de ellos 4, 444 mujeres y 536 hombres. Eh, la siguiente. Aquí fue en lo, los resultados, la verdad, nos, nos, nos sorprendieron. Eh, pudimos catalogar los resultados en tres grandes, eh, tre, tres grandes factores. El primero encontramos que eh, estos resultados, bueno, son, son eh, es nuestro primer acercamiento, nuestro primer mapeo de, de, de competencias que deben de desarrollarse o que deberían de estar presentes en el desarrollo de, de, de nuevos liderazgos dentro de las CIES, en este caso específicamente en México. ¿sí? Encontramos que el primer factor, bueno, liderazgo, actitudes, valores, ¿sí? se, se, se pronunció mucho la, la parte de valores. Y luego en el segundo factor, bueno, habilidades de gestión, todo lo que tiene que ver con habilidades, gestión, innovación y planificación. Y en el tercer factor, bueno, encontramos la importancia de la experiencia, del conocimiento, este, del conocimiento desde la experiencia, del conocimiento académico de cada uno de los, de los directivos y el conocimiento organizacional. O sea, no nada más era saber, eh, tener conocimiento, sino también saber hacer. La siguiente, por favor. Encontramos, eh, como ellos mismos eh, eh, se, les, se les consultó en una parte de la encuesta, cuáles eran los nuevos desafíos a los que ellos se enfrentaban y bueno, estuvimos aplicando el, el, el cuestionario precisamente durante la pandemia, entonces mucho tenía que ver con las situaciones que se estaban viviendo en ese momento, pero que también entendemos que pueden ser situaciones que llegaron para quedarse, ¿verdad?, eh, como la de descubrimos mucho la necesidad de, de poder trabajar con competencias blandas, con esa parte socioemocional que va implícita en, en el liderazgo, definitivamente a, eh, gestionar durante las crisis, sea sanitaria, sea cualquier tipo de crisis, creo que es, esa, es, esos nuevos desafíos surgen en, en, en esta discusión, eh, aparecen reiteradamente, como lo vimos dentro de, de los tres factores, eh, los valores y la ética que están mezclados un poco con esta nueva concepción de ver eh, la, 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 los liderazgos, de ver las, las actividades directivas, pero ahí más allá solo de la operación y de la obtención de resultados. Eh, y definitivamente, bueno, vemos una influencia muy fuerte de los ODS, eh, hablando de inclusión, hablando de igualdad, hablando de, de calidad, hablando de internacionalización, de innovación. Y uno, precisamente en innovación, bueno, el reto que tienen los directivos para innovar desde la, desde la educación. 
Y definitivamente, bueno, pues trabajar con la autogestión personal, ¿verdad? El estar bien nosotros mismos como, como personas, como líderes, antes de, de trabajar con, con los demás o para tener, lograr un mejor impacto en el trabajo de los demás. La siguiente, por favor. Estas son, eh, estas son tres, tres, cuatro, algunas recomendaciones que nosotros hacemos y es, este, bueno, entender que creo que de ahora en adelante tendremos que transformar nuestra gestión y, y transformarla hacia el servicio, ¿sí? que, que es algo que salió reiteradamente, que eh, sugerimos también que a este tipo de prácticas se integren más rectores, puesto que son ellos los que son las cabezas de las, de las instituciones y pueden facilitar las transiciones o los cambios. Y eh, pretendemos replicar este estudio eh, en otros países de América Latina para tener un mapa más amplio de lo, de lo, que, está de lo que están pensando y de lo que está pasando en más países. ¿Sí? Y una de nuestras eh, aportaciones creemos definitivamente todos los implicados, eh, principalmente Advance y nosotros, que este, que, eh, que este tipo de actividades bueno, deben de impactar más allá de solo ser una investigación, sino ir directo a acciones específicas dentro de los cargos, dentro de las instituciones, como son los perfiles de puesto en los directivos, a través de todas las instituciones, tanto las nuestras como las de Advance, que tienen contacto directo con las instituciones de educación superior, en este caso de las Américas. Bueno, esta sería mi intervención. Gracias por, por, la, por escucharme. Perdón, me tardé un poco, un poco más. Adelante. Le cedo la palabra a Du. Doug, you're on mute. Okay. Am I off mute now? Can you all hear me? Good. Thank you. I was just thanking Letitia and uh, and also just saying thank you for, for, for that summary of a, a really important study coming from Mexico. Uh, and I think within that study, there's a lot that can be taken away and into other contexts in terms of uh, our, our answer to that question, which is the title for this panel, what works for leadership in higher education? And it's an incredibly important question at the moment. So um, Advance HE, uh, is uh, at the stage of launching um, a global study uh, around this uh, to develop a global uh, leadership survey and in due course an accompanying framework to explore precisely that question, what works for leadership in higher education. So uh, working with the sector, we plan to develop a global survey over the course of um, this academic year, 21-22, uh, uh, for higher education, research institutes and other related organizations. And really, the extraordinary events of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic that have been experienced in different ways around the world have highlighted the importance of leadership, both for organizational success, but also for staff, student engagement and well-being. So that question uh, coming through the pandemic experience is becoming more important than ever. And what we hope this uh, project will generate is a unique evidence base for leadership in higher education uh, coming through the survey itself to also highlight contextual variations across the sector and also around the world um, and to explore the impact of leadership development. The more closely we understand what works for leadership, the more um, uh, capable we are of supporting the development of leaders. Uh, and it will also um, inform things like um, uh, the, the, the structure and function of leadership teams. So, uh, Um, so in this session, um, I want to take you through a little bit about what we're doing with regard to this uh, leadership survey and framework, but I'd also like to start to get some participation from you as an audience at this conference in this panel today. So there are two ways in which you can participate. We'll be having some live polls, and the way to engage with those polls is through the link there, pollev.com forward slash Douglas Parkey 753, and the, the link will be dropped into the chat so you can 
can just cut and paste that. And then once you've linked, each poll will activate automatically. And we'll also have one short breakout conversation as well, just you with one partner, a random partner from the group on the screen, just to explore a, a question around values and behavior. So uh, we hope to get uh, uh, a good piece of participation going um, as we engage with this, uh, uh, this session. So as I say, the, the project itself launched on the 25th of August uh, 2021. And so we are now in uh, the phase that we call the research scoping study towards the development of that leadership survey. So what's the vision? What's the purpose of this? Well, three things really. Overall, to inform debate, research, practice, both nationally and internationally around higher education leadership. Um, focus, focusing externally in terms of advanced HE's work, having a framework for leadership and leadership development that could inform good practice, but also be the basis for recognition as well and possible accreditations. And internally within advanced HE, um, a thematic and tailored framework uh, for our own programs, our own consultants, and our own thought leadership. So the, um, the work that we're doing will work in those three ways. That's the vision, that's the purpose of what we're doing. Okay, so what works for leadership in higher education? Without clearer understanding, um, it's really difficult. It's got some noise coming through. It's really difficult to invest in leaders, to support leaders, to develop leaders, to recognize leaders in a consistent and a reliable way. So we need that richer understanding. And that can also inform organizational design, the structure of leadership teams, and also help us to de develop the talent for the future. So what is good leadership? What is good leadership? There's a question. That's a huge question to plant uh, in this group today. Um, uh, a fascinating set of words here. The point of studying leadership is to answer this question. What is good leadership? And the point of teaching is to develop good leaders. And the use of the word here has two senses, morally good and technically good or effective. So a morally good leader in terms of their values, the culture, the connection that they create, but also technically good in terms of their effectiveness as a communicator, as a planner, as someone capable of analyzing the context or whatever it might be. And actually a leader who has those two things, morally good and technically effective is in a really strong position. Okay, so the advanced aims of the, um, the, the survey that we're working to develop, as I say, a global survey, um, uh, participation um, welcomed from all contexts around the world, to produce that evidence base, to add to our understanding of actually how staff and colleagues in higher education even conceive of leadership, and it's a contested space. What is leadership? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? And to explore those different um, ideas. Uh, to start to articulate values, behaviours and constructs that contribute to good leadership. Uh, and that in turn can inform the development of the framework. To highlight contextual variations across the sector around the world. And importantly, also to contrast the views of those leading and those being led. So the survey we're looking to design will ask people as a leader, what's important, but also as someone being led by others, what is important, what matters. To explore the impact of leadership development and to promote the importance of the reflective leadership practitioner, the leadership practitioner who's looking to continuously review and enhance their practice, not just for the good of themselves, but critically for the good of the community they serve. So the journey we're on, just to give you a sense of the, um, the process here, we've initiated and commissioned a scoping study, so a research scoping study uh, to inform the design of the survey. And this is being carried out by a research team uh, from the University of Bristol, uh, the University of the West of England and Swansea University working in collaboration with ourselves. And this scoping study will involve a literature review and also a series of 10 round tables working working with different colleagues within the higher education community. Those round tables will run through to uh, the end of December and then in uh, the beginning
different times for different time zones. We'll then have a further phase of data analysis before the scoping study is concluded, which will then inform the development of the Global Leadership Survey, which we hope to launch um, around about May or June uh, in 2022. So that gives you a sense of the, uh, the path through, as it were. The roundtable discussions, I won't um, uh, speak through everything that's on the screen there, but from uh, professors to senior leaders to early career academics to professional staff from those funding higher education a wide variety of um, uh, colleagues and stakeholders as you can see and in fact we've just added an 11th round table um, because uh, the uh, the interest uh, is so high uh, the literature review that's uh, all, already well underway, looking at uh, books, papers and reports from the last 30 years, uh, from a range of disciplines, from education and sociology through to management and organisational studies, um, selected for their particular relevance to higher education with an international focus, so drawing on literature from around the world, and spanning subjects, professional areas, institutional types and different roles. And so far, the literature review um, is uh, encompassing over 200 citations. So it's a significant piece of work. Okay, um, so from the literature review, um, so far, there are three perspectives emerging, and I'd just like us to explore those perspectives a little bit uh, in the time that we have. Traditionalist, to do with culture, reformist to do with values and purpose and Letitia was touching upon the importance of that from the Mexico study and then the pragmatist perspective in terms of skills and competencies so let's just touch on each of those in time so culture we'll just have a little play with that taken for granted values, attitudes, ways of behaving within an order, organization, the things that we gradually take for granted about who we are and how we are. And this integrated culture framework I'm sharing with you here, two dimensions to it, the level of flexibility or stability that exists within the organization and the preference around how much independence do people have, or how much interdependence, the degree to which we work as a collective. And those factors throw up different kinds of cultures, from um, an authority-based culture, to a learning culture, to a purpose-driven culture, as you can see on the screen there. So different cultures emerge in different ways. An interesting question is with prolonged virtual working, what direction does that propel us in, in terms of culture? Well, maybe towards a more stable and independent way of working, uh, which draws out more authority and less that's to do with purpose. So it's something to really watch for as we work in virtual environments. Anyway, I'd just like to get your involvement uh, with the first dynamic poll here. So if we can again pop the link into the chat, there it is. So um, you can select up to two. So reflecting on your own institution or department, um, which sounds most like your culture? Is it structured and controlled? Does it feel like a collegium or community? Is it very dynamic, an enterprise? Or is it very results orientated and task driven? So if you can connect with that poll through the link there, you can select one or two of those reflecting on your own department or institution. So I'll just leave you to respond to that for a moment. Aha, some, some results starting to come through in real time on the screen. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for participating, everyone. It's interesting to see it move, interesting to see it emerge as different responses come in. Mm. 
Mm, it's shifting in real time. Lovely, and I'll just count down from, from five for any last results to come through. So five and four, three, two, and one. Oh, a few final pieces of movement. So it's very interesting to see just our little snapshot in this session today. Um, uh, a lot of our organizations feel quite task driven, um, a focus around structure, um, maybe a little less so in terms of the emphasis around the community and engaging engagement and dynamic and enterprising as well. So an even balance aside from the results focus, which seems to be high in our little survey there. And it's an important question to consider, isn't it? The culture in many ways determines the leadership. So the sort of culture that we're looking to create will have an influence over the values that we need to bring to our leadership. So if we want to create more of a community, what values does that suggest? If we want to be more enterprising as an institution, what kind of values and behaviours does that suggest? So thank you again for your responses. Fascinating to see. And of course, culture it exists as an iceberg. There's that little tip of the organization that's visible, but there's so much, as it says there, the, the, the iceberg that sinks organizational change. There's so much under the surface in terms of values, the unwritten norms that influences how culture plays out. OK, let's come to the second perspective. Uh, the reformist perspective that's coming through the literature to do with values and purpose in higher education. So those values like a like a stick of rock, wherever you cut us, you see the same values expressed there or guiding principles. And then a purpose, purpose, the anchor of the institution, what we're fundamentally here for. And in many ways, the first job of leadership certainly strategic leadership is to speak the language of purpose, to make meaning of the context and to speak the language of purpose. Who are we and what are we fundamentally here for? That's the basis for engagement. So what's the point in purpose? What's the point in purpose? My next question to you. So using the same link, you can engage in a poll and this one will create a word cloud for us. So what's the point in purpose? What does it create? What does it inspire? Just single words for this. Um, please respond away. And I, I have to be prepared not, that not all of the words will be in English, but that's fine. It's your, your word cloud. So you put in whatever words you wish using the same polev.com forward slash Douglas Parkey 753 link. Focus. That's a great word to start with, doesn't it? Purpose gives us focus and choice. Once we have focus, we've got a basis for making strategic decisions. Directions there, right alongside it, thank you. Common goal, targets, confidence. That's an interesting word. If we know what our purpose is, our institutional confidence can grow. If we're not so sure, Perhaps as an institution, we, our confidence is weaker and then our connections as a community become weaker still. Motivation, yeah. Purpose gives energy. If we know who we are, if we know what we're here for, then I can think about my individual contribution, my competencies to come back to Letitia's fantastic work. I can think about those competencies serving that purpose, and that's where I get my human energy from. Growth is there, goals. It's the basis of so much. The first job of leadership to articulate and express purpose. It's so important. Confidence becoming a very big word in our word cloud there. It gives us a mission. It's the basis for inclusion. Fantastic. Thank you so much for these responses. Okay. It is the essence of leadership. Lovely. Okay, I'm gonna count 
back from five to one, just for any final words to come in. Five and four and three and two and one. Amazing. And if we just take that set of words, it just tells us everything about what strategy should be about. The articulation and expression of purpose that gives us focus, that gives us choice, that creates strategic direction. Wonderful. So what's the point in purpose? Well, purpose is the point. Um, this from uh, um, Bartlett and Goschel captures it for me, that um, in today's world, we move, need to move towards this softer, more organic approach that's about purpose and people and away from just rigid structures and strategies. And as it says there, the definition and articulation of purpose must be top management's first responsibility. A little bit around values. Um, not too much time for this, so I'll just mention it a little bit. But is there heart in what you're doing? Values put the heart into what you're doing. So the bottom line is not just money. The bottom line is also people, staff, students, the community, other stakeholders we work with. So your bottom line, not just money, not just pounds, but people too. Is there some heart in what you're doing? And values are the things that transcend our differences across an institutional community. So for leaders, values are of extraordinary importance. A question I'll just give you, we could have a discussion on this, but I don't think there is time, is just to think uh, about uh, values linked to behavior. So in many ways, we shouldn't have to tell people what our values are. We shouldn't have to tell people what our values are. It should show through our behavior. Um, and a, an important question for leaders, and again, um, in uh, Letitia's work there in Mexico, it came through the importance of values sitting alongside competencies. So underpinned by our values, what's the most important behavior for you as an individual leader to model? So if those are our values, what behaviours should I be modelling that in turn influence the behaviours of others around the institution and the organisation? It's a really important question. That link between values, competencies and behaviours. And in many ways, we lead through the behaviours that we model. Yeah. We can get very caught up in thinking about the things that we should do as leaders. We also need to think about how do we need to be as leaders to embody those values. Okay, so the last perspective. So we've had the traditionalist about culture. We've had the reformist about purpose and values. The third one coming through the literature review so far is the pragmatist the skills and the competencies of higher education leaders. Now, there are many ways to model and present this. Uh, this is a model that we use um, within Advance HE, the model of engaging transformational leadership um, from Professor Beverly Alamo Metcalf. And it talks about um, the importance of positive emotions upon the performance of organizations and teams. And it was really interesting, again, in the Mexico study to see emotional intelligence highlighted so, so really, really clearly. Um, so there's something about the, um, uh, the, the competencies linked to how it makes people, other people feel. If people feel good about themselves through really engaging leadership, they in turn will perform uh, to a higher level. So that's one construct um, that you can see on the screen there, the engaging leadership model as it's termed. Um, so let's come back to you with our third and final poll for this um, session. And this is a ranking exercise. So I've given you uh, seven things to rank. Um, the one you consider most important, please put at the top least important towards the bottom, using the same link. So in terms of leadership, good practice, creating meaning and vision, empowering other people's autonomy, 
helping people to develop their talents, showing appreciation through feedback, creating a safe environment, physically and psychologically for people to perform, enabling social support and collaboration, or recognizing and celebrating progress. So please uh, join the poll there and just rank those in order of importance in terms of your vision of good leadership. Mm. Could we put the link in the chat again? It's pollev.com. Oh, it's already there. Pollev.com forward slash Douglas Parkey 753. Okay, we have some results coming in. So which matters most in this ranking exercise? It's fascinating to see the results already. And you won't be right or wrong about this. <laughs> you won't be right or wrong about this because in many ways, all of these matter. So it's just getting your individual uh, perspective, just giving you an opportunity to, to reflect on these uh, seven areas. A few more responses coming in. I hope you can all see it clearly on the screens. Okay. We seem to have a strong first position around helping others develop their talents. And that may be other people's talents as leaders. And it's really interesting to think of leaders as developers of leaders and distributing leadership within the organization. Okay, I'll just let, let a last few responses come in. Very well done for engaging with the poll. Thank you, everyone on the call. Okay, so once again, I'm gonna count back from five, just for any final results to come in. Five and four and three and two and one. Okay, isn't that fascinating? So in our small sample in this session today, we have helping others develop their talents as our most important leadership good practice. And towards the bottom, recognize and celebrating progress. Uh, just one up from that is showing appreciation through feedback. Um, interesting to think about actually uh, giving people really strong, really well put together feedback can be so important for releasing performance and potential and developing others. But as I say, there's no one answer to this. Um, our, our small poll has ranked them, as you can see. Each of these seven areas is important. Um, this is taken from some work by Amabile and Kramer. And what their work emphasizes is that in leadership, good practice is good practice. And looking across um, organizations and sectors, there's some fairly consistent areas for leadership good practice. And that good practice applies equally whether you're supporting a team online or working with them in a shared space. And these are them creating meaning, allowing people to develop autonomy, helping people through mastery to develop their talents, showing appreciation for what people do, creating safety, physical and psychological, enabling social support so that teams can work well together and collaborate, and celebrating and acknowledging progress. And you can see on the other side, some of the things that uh, fairly consistently are not good practice for leadership and uh, colleague engagement. I won't read through the list. So there's something consistent about good practice and really the, the, the work we're doing towards the survey is in a way looking to really distill and refine that for the context of higher education. Last couple of things from me. Never forget that leadership ultimately is in the eye of the beholder. So what I say about myself as a leader doesn't matter. It's how others experience me. Yes, so the eye of the beholder is crucial. And my last thought to share with you is about wholehearted leadership. 
And this is fundamentally about balance. On the one hand, I have passion for our purpose, what we're here to achieve. On the other hand, I have true compassion, feelings and emotion for those that are working with me to achieve it. Passion for purpose and compassion for people. That's wholehearted leadership. If you just have one without the other, that's half-hearted leadership. And if you don't have either, that's break your heart leadership. Thank you very much for listening. So a little bit about the survey, a little bit about those three perspectives from the leadership, uh, literature review so far, and a little bit of discussion and engagement around those three perspectives. I hope that's been interesting. I hope you've enjoyed a, a bit of participation there. So we only have um, a minute or so left. Um, we can uh, take one or two questions um, if anyone um, in the in the audience would like to maybe post a question uh, into the chat that's there. And these could be questions for myself, for Becky or for Letitia, if you have any at this moment, but we we are into our last couple of minutes. We have some thanks appearing and um you know that it, it was lovely to have your participation as a group in those polls in many ways um particularly that last one those uh that those good those seven good practices we can put whichever one we want at the top whichever one we want at the bottom all seven of those matter and certainly they were reflected uh, in the findings in the uh, Mexico report and survey that Letitia spoke about. And I'm sure in different ways, they're gonna come through in the le leadership survey, the global leadership survey uh, that Advance HE is constructing. Yes, so a question here from Heather McRae. Do we expect cultural differences to be apparent based on where people live? Um, yes, uh, uh, absolutely we do. Um, so there are two things I would say in response to that. One is, um, to pick out some of the consistent threads across um, nations and regions, but also to develop uh, a, an appreciation of those differences across time and distance uh, and coming through different cultural contexts and um, the, 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 the cultural context that drives the values of leadership. So that will be a, a very interesting aspect of, of this to report upon, particularly how something like academic leadership is constructed in different cultural contexts. Thank you very much for that question. That's an important one. And that's one of the reasons our ambition is for the leadership survey to be a global exercise. So I think we're just about at our time. Um, and um, I don't want to leave without thanking you as a group for being with us for this session. Um, it's, been an absolute pleasure to be on the panel with Becky and Letitia this afternoon. Uh, thanks you all for being part of it. Um, uh, this quest for that question, what works for leadership in higher education is more important today than ever. So it's fantastic to see your interest in the work that Letitia's doing and the work that we're doing at Advance HE. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>